Welcome everyone to our video on calorimetry. In this video, we are going to discuss how calorimetry is carried out experimentally and exactly what calorimetry is. We're going to define a measurement called specific heat capacity. We're going to describe how heat is measured both in words and using a mathematical equation. And then we're just going to touch upon the relationship between these heat measurements and the energy change in chemical reactions. And that's a concept that we're going to explore more fully in future lessons. Let's start off with a definition. Calorimetry is simply the process of measuring energy changes that occur in physical or chemical changes. In order to carry out the process of calorimetry, we use a calorimeter. And it is a device that's designed to measure the energy exchange and by reducing the amount of energy that's lost to the rest of the environment or the rest of the surroundings. The simplest calorimeter is a coffee cup calorimeter. The one you see there on the screen involves two styrofoam coffee cups, one embedded in the other, a lid on top, and then typically water or a dilute solution, often an acid, is, uh, is inside the coffee cups. And when you carry out some sort of reaction in there, and there's a little hole on the top of the cup where you can insert a thermometer to measure temperature changes. The point of it is that we've provided insulation so that where we are measuring the energy exchange is going to be fairly close to the actual energy exchange, and we haven't lost a lot of that energy to the surroundings. This middle diagram is another calorimeter. You see the thermometer coming out of the top, just made out of a higher quality materials. What you see on the right is what's called a bomb calorimeter, and it is um, useful for measuring energy changes in reactions, often combustion reactions, that involve the production of or use of gases. It's different from these previous two in that it is very tightly sealed and so it maintains a constant volume. And so if gases are produced, it's the producing a, co a constant volume and the pressure is going to increase. In the left two images, there's going to be slight holes uh, in, in those calorimeters. So when gases are produced, the pressure can maintain at atmospheric pressure. Calorimetry is the study or the process of measuring heat changes and a calorimeter is the device that's used. So how do we actually go about doing this? Well, one of the more important concepts to keep in mind is that we are always doing our measurements in the surroundings. Specifically, we often set up the experiments so that the chemical system is immediately surrounded by a substance like water or a dilute aqueous solution. And that is because those substances can absorb a lot of heat before it's lost to the rest of the surroundings. Recall that the surroundings actually consist of the entire universe, but you can't have a thermometer you know, on one side of the lab, carry out a reaction on the other side of the lab and expect that the thermometer is going to pick up any sort of temperature change. As soon as energy is released by a chemical reaction, it's dispersed around the universe. So we set up calorimetry experiments so that the chemical system is immediately surrounded by a substance in which we can easily measure temperature changes before it gets lost to the rest of the universe. There are three factors which go into determining the amount of heat gained or lost by a substance. The first is the mass of a substance. The higher the mass, the more heat that substance can hold. Tiny amount of water can only hold a small amount of heat, whereas a large amount of water can hold more heat. The second factor is the specific heat capacity of a substance, which we will define shortly. 
And finally, the temperature change that the substance undergoes as a result of the heat lost or gained. Specific heat capacity is a measurement of the amount of heat that's required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree. A substance with a high specific heat capacity requires a lot of heat to raise its temperature. A substance with a low specific heat capacity is a substance that even with a small amount of energy put in, its temperature goes up quickly. If needed, you'll always be provided with values for different substances for their specific heat capacity. However, we will be using the value for water so often that you should know that one. And you should know it rounded to two decimal places. The symbol for specific heat capacity is a lowercase c, and the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And that means that in order to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, you have to input 4.18 joules of energy. Mathematically, the heat absorbed or lost by a substance is calculated using a very simple equation, Q equals mc delta t, where Q is the amount of heat, in, often in joules, m is the mass, c is the specific heat capacity, and delta t is the temperature change, which is always calculated the final temperature subtract the initial temperature. So if the temperature of a substance increases, we will end up with a positive value for delta T, and if it decreases, we'll end up with a negative value. As a result, the sign on delta T will determine whether the Q value is negative or positive because the mass and specific heat capacity of a substance are always going to be positive. Remember that all of these values, mass, specific heat uh, capacity, and temperature change are referencing the substance in the surroundings in which we are measuring the temperature change, which as I've said, is oftentimes water or an aqueous solution. Let's now look at an example here. Here's a common reaction where we have one gram of magnesium reacting with 50 grams of dilute hydrochloric acid in a coffee cup calorimeter. As a result of the reaction, the temperature of the solution increases from 20.5 to 36 degrees Celsius. And we wanted to determine the heat that's lost or gained by the surroundings. So our first step in any sort of mathematical problem is to identify the givens that uh, we have in this question. If we want to calculate the heat, we need to know the mass, the specific heat capacity, and the temperature change. Well, let's start with the temperature change. The temperature has increased, so that must mean that the surroundings has gained energy. 36 degrees minus 20.5 gives us 15.5 degrees Celsius. Next up is mass. Now this is often a confusing one because in the question, you're given two masses. You're given the mass of the solution and you're given the mass of the magnesium. Well, remember in the Q equals MC delta T equation, the mass value is for the substance in which you are measuring the temperature change. And it's stated in the question, that's the temperature of the solution that's increasing in temperature. So that's why we're using the 50 grams of hydrochloric acid. Finally, we have our C value. Now, I gave the C value here for water and there's nowhere in the question that says water. However, here is an assumption that we can make, which is fairly safe for most of the experiments that we would be dealing with. And that is, is that for a dilute solution, because a vast majority of that solution is actually water molecules, that its C value is 
close enough to waters that we can use that uh, 4.18 value. Our next step is to simply plug in those values and calculate the heat. Now you wanna watch out for units here. Remember that 4.18 um, is joules per gram degrees Celsius. So we need to make sure our mass is in grams, our temperature is in degrees Celsius or degrees Kelvin would work as well. And then our answer is going to be in joules. Q is equal to positive 3,239.5 joules. Now, in problems, we always want to state our final answer. And so you need to be careful with the wording here. The question asked us to determine the heat lost or gained by the surroundings. When we use the Q equals MC delta T equation, that calculated Q value is the energy that was measured in the surroundings. If we have a Q that's greater than zero, that means that heat is gained or absorbed by the surroundings. If we have a Q value that's less than zero, that means heat is lost or was released by the surroundings. So the way we would state this, 3,239.5 joules of energy was gained by the surrounding, or you could say was absorbed by the surroundings. For this question here, that may not seem so important, but in our following lessons, we're going to start switching from talking about energy in the surroundings to talking about energy changes in the system. And the, the way we word these things and our use of positive and negative signs on our energy values is going to become incredibly important. So that's why we emphasize it here.